welcome everybody to the third of our um, of our processes, third of our uh, the right word? collection symposium session. Thank you, thank you. You should be up here rather than me. Um, so this is about opioids, and um, what we have here today this is really special. First of all, my name is Mark Plan, I'm the counselor here in Lawrence. Um, I'm on the front lines, but a very different front lines than these guys, ladies are, with respect to to the drug scourge that we're facing in our city. Uh, I'm hopeful that I'm learning a lot from what these folks are facing as they are hitting the streets and they're dealing with it for their various capacities. Um, and then at some point I might try to add a little bit of value to what we're doing as a city and what we're seeing from government perspective. So today we have three of our panelists. Um, to my immediate left is Dr. Eli Atta. Um, his their bios are all on here. Uh, what I wanted to say was something a little bit different about them. I asked them each, give me one little tidbit that we're not going to read on uh, this thing. And so what I, I, he says, I asked him, what's your, what's your thing? He's like, I like the outdoors. I like to hike. I like to run. Just put me outdoors and I'll be happy. Um, and he recently has loved a tremendous amount of weight loss as well. And I'm very proud of that. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And public health will take very seriously. Uh, to the next to him is uh, Dr. Wait a second, report. Thank you, Ryan. So Dr. Ryan Dono. Now I said to him, I go, so what's what's your deal, Dr. Dono? He says, you know, I like to play soccer. I go, where do you play soccer? Because I'm in an over 30, over 40 league, and I go, but I don't spend as much time as I'd like to because I got two kids, I got an infant. He says, but uh, but I am playing over there. I didn't even know they had a, oh no, a uh, a soccer tournament or soccer clubs going on in the city of Lawrence in my district. So anyway, <laughs> so Sunday mornings is when he plays. If you want to see him, that's where he'll be. And lastly is Dr. Rebecca Lee, who um, her thing, when she has the time, is she likes to draw. She's an artist. Um, and recently, I think she actually had a meeting with uh, Governor Baker as well regarding the opioid thing. And, and I'm a big fan of, of Governor Baker, so I'm really impressed that he reached out to you to get some input on what's going on. So. I'm going to stop talking. We want to hear from these folks. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to cover the opiate epidemic in Lawrence. Uh, so bear with us for a second. We have some technical finessing to do. Um, so our objectives, we're going to explain the basic neurobiology of addiction. Uh, we'll re oh. yeah, Thank you, right? Uh, we'll review the origins of opioid addiction. And we'll review the available options as well. We're going to discuss the importance of harm reduction, explore the structural and cultural barriers, and review treatments. So if I can do this correctly. Eventually they slip and start using again. 
Why are drugs so hard to quit? I didn't quit. Because addiction is a brain disease. I have to win. Addiction is when you feel a strong urge to keep taking a drug, even if it's causing harm. To stop, ask for help. Your brain is like a control tower. It sends out signals that direct your actions and choices. When you take drugs, the chemical signals in your brain change. This affects your choices, your actions, and even the way you feel. The part of your brain that lets you feel pleasure can be changed by drugs. Normally, this pleasure center is active when you eat, fall in love, or experience something else you enjoy. After a while, the drug becomes more important. When someone takes a drug, they first feel a rush or a high. But over time, the high is not as strong, and they need the drug to keep from feeling bad. This is what happens when you are addicted. But you don't have to stay that way. Quitting drugs is hard, but it can be done. If you or someone you love has a problem, get help. Find drug treatment near you. Call 1-800-662. So with that, all that information as poorly presented as it was in mind, um, it gives everybody a basis to, to, to to understand what we're about to talk about. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Dr. Lee take over. I'm gonna stand over okay? Sure. Um, that's okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Becky. I'm a first year resident at the clinic down the street, um, along with Eli. Um, before we got get started, I wanted to figure out who was in the room with us because Addiction is a really broad topic, and I think, um, not a, I don't know, I want to see where we're at. So how many people work in Lawrence in this room? Okay, so like half. Um, how many people live in Lawrence? Okay, me too, awesome. Um, how many of you have jobs that are either directly or indirectly related to the opioid epidemic? Okay, so a lot of people have kind of seen this um, already. Um, so the first thing I want to make sure before we launch into the opioid epidemic is making sure that we all understand what addiction is. And I'm not just talking about opioid addiction, but really any substance. So alcohol, cigarettes, um, even sh like sugar, all these things work on the same part of the brain. Um, and there are a lot of misconceptions about what addiction is. Um, so I think in order to understand the current epidemic, we need to know what addiction is. <coughs> So first and foremost, addiction is a brain disease. And uh, there's, there's been a lot of research on, on this. And when we talk about these different substances, um, we're talking about changes that uh, happen in the brain over time. And addiction, just like diabetes or high blood pressure, is a chronic relapsing disease that um, basically results after someone has been using these substances. People have different susceptibility to addiction. So some people will, say, smoke a cigarette twice and then have no problem letting go, and other people will smoke a cigarette twice, and um, based on the neurobiochemistry of their brain, are more susceptible to becoming addicted to that substance. Um, the second point I think that is really important is that addiction is a relapsing disease. So once someone has been addicted to a substance, even if they successfully are able to achieve recovery, they will have that disease of addiction for the rest of their lives. And so, you know, it might be a week, a month, or 10 years after they used, last used a substance, but they will still have features of that disease, craving, and if they were to relapse and go back to using it, um, effects of withdrawal, etc. I'm not using the microphone, is that okay? That's for actually recording. Use it. Okay, use it. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, but addiction is also not just a brain disease, right? Like when we hear about it in the media, there's so many things that come into play with addiction. So um, uh, behavioral things and uh, social components of addiction. And so when we talk about treating addiction, on the one hand, you want to treat it as a disease, and we're going to talk about the different medications available to do that, but you can't treat addiction without also addressing the social aspects and the cultural aspects um, that affect people with addiction on an everyday level. 
Uh, I think in the past, and even still with a lot of people, addiction is often seen as a moral failure. Uh, we will see someone who uh, is using heroin and think, oh, that person must be a bad person, or there must be something that they did that got them to that place. Uh, but in actual fact, now that we have more research on it, there are a lot of different avenues to becoming addicted to these different substances, in some cases through your doctor, like us, um, which we're now realizing more and more, and it's not necessarily a moral failure. So when we think about it from a medical perspective, and I have a patient in front of me coming in and saying, hey, I've been using oxycodone, and, and I, you know, I just keep using it, and I've been buying it off the street, because whenever I don't use it, um, I, I start feeling really terrible. Um, in a medical setting, we use something called the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, this is the manual that basically describes the definition of every mental disorder. Um, so psychiatrists, psychologists, and family doctors also use this manual. One thing I want to point out in this is that the DSM-5, which I think came out a year or two ago, it's the fifth iteration of this. Um, changed some of the language, and Dr. Ko pointed this out in his talk this morning, but they no longer say substance abuse disorder, they use the wording substance use disorder. Um, to me, I think that's really important because uh, one of the problems with, uh, one of the barriers in treating addiction is that we have a lot of stigma, and part of that is because of the language that we use. So when you think of the word abuse, we associate that with domestic violence and child abuse. And when you call someone a substance abuser because they're using a drug, that's also putting them into that same category of person when really it's, it's a brain disease. It's not necessarily someone who's you know, harming other people. Um, so if we go down the criteria of addiction as um, psychiatrists define it, um, Individuals experiencing addiction will have two to three of these criteria if they have mild disorder, um, four to five if moderate, and six or more as severe. So taking the opioid in larger amounts and for longer than intended. Wanting to cut down or quit but not being able to do it. Spending a lot of time obtaining the opioid and you know, that might mean skipping work one day because you're feeling withdrawal and you really need to get that substance in order to feel normal. And you're, you're spending a lot of time going out of your way to do that. Craving or strong desire to use opioids. Uh, repeatedly uh, unable to carry out major obligations like work, school, taking care of your kids. Uh, continued use despite persistent <coughs> or recurring social or interpersonal problems. So um, I know in Dr. Dono's talk, um, like an hour ago, he was talking about the homeless population in Lawrence, and I think, you know, these drugs really destroy people's lives, and yet they keep using it, and why is that? So that is actually one of the definitions of addiction. Uh, recurrent use of opioids in physically hazardous situations, so staying under the bridge and continuing to use, even when that's putting yourself at danger. Um, and tolerance which I'm going to go into in a second. So uh, the concept of tolerance and having withdrawal sim uh, sim symptoms. And those two things go more into the neurobiochemical um, disease of addiction. OK, so I wanted to talk about a really basic concept, which is tolerance and physical dependence. So. Uh, we can, this could be any substance. It could be a cigarette, it could be uh, oxycodone, heroin, um, Coca-Cola maybe. The first time you drink that Coca-Cola or the first time you um, use that substance, I guess that's not really a good example. Um, but basically you, you, you should take a shot of heroin or take an oxycodone and you feel this euphoric sensation afterwards. And so what's happening is that substance is acting on the brain and it acts on the pleasure reward system of your brain and it makes you feel euphoric. After a little while, and depending on your individual neurobiochemistry, um, you know, you've been using for a little bit and you get to the point where your brain has developed more receptors for that substance and so it takes more of that substance to fill them in order to create the euphoric event. 
So if you still take the same amount, you're just going to feel normal at your baseline. And then eventually, when you really are developing that category of severe addiction, uh, you get into withdrawal. So if you're not using that substance, you have all these dopamine receptors in your brain that are just open. And if you're not using the substance in a regular basis, you end up with withdrawal. Um, does anyone know the symptoms of withdrawal? I think some people. So it's basically like the worst flu you've ever had. And when I've talked to patients who have experienced withdrawal, they explain it as feeling like they were going to die. You know, sweating, fevers, shakes, um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It, it really feels awful. And so it's understandable that once you've been using a substance, you would not want to feel that way. And so you end up using more and more in order to just feel normal. So a lot of people with opioid addiction, they are not really feeling that euphoric um, sense anymore. Uh, and they would require much higher doses to get there, and they're really just trying to feel normal because their brain has developed uh, this physiology that means that um, they basically are dependent on this drug now. This graph is just uh, describing the same thing, and I think Dr. Ada is going to get into it in a little bit, but um, you know, acute use, when you first start using, you feel that euphoria, but then with chronic use, you don't get to the euphoria anymore and you actually are in withdrawal a lot of the time unless you're using and using and using. Uh, and with some of these drugs like fentanyl, it has a very half short life, uh, short life, half life, which means that um, after like an hour, the substance isn't working anymore and you are feeling that withdrawal and you end up, you know, using heroin maybe 20, 30, 40 times a day just to feel like yourself. So, um, why doesn't everyone who breaks their arm and takes some oxycodone after they're in the hospital for pain relief, why don't they all become addicted to these opioids? Um, that depends on a lot of different things. But I think it's important to know that some people, their genetic makeup just makes them more susceptible to addiction. And really, only 10% of people who are exposed to that addictive substance will actually develop an addiction. There are a lot of different risk factors uh, for addiction. Uh, one of them is a family history, and we know that historically from alcohol, that if you had um, a parent who is an alcoholic, that you have uh, like a 50% chance of going on to develop that, and it's really high. Uh, and the same is true for opioid addiction. Uh, also, if you have psychiatric illness, we talk about dual diagnosis, which means uh, psychiatric illness and a substance use disorder, and I think uh, something like 90% or more of people who have a substance use disorder also have a concurrent psychiatric illness. So when you have a patient in your office uh, asking for help for their substance use disorder, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, one thing in medicine that we look at a lot when we're looking at family history, you know, if your grandfather had diabetes, how likely are you to have diabetes? We look at twin studies. So basically you have two twins, they have a family member, let's say they have a father with substance use disorder. The twins are separated at birth, and so environmentally they're not exposed to the same living environment. So you're taking the nature part of, out of nature and nurture. And so do they develop that disease? And if you look at all these different disorders, type 1 diabetes has a 0.3 to 0.55, so like 30 to 55 percent heritability rate. Um, alcohol dependence has a 0.55, so 50 percent, um, meaning that the two twins, if one has the uh, alcohol use disorder, then the other one has a 50 percent chance of having that. And if you look at heroin dependence, it's up there. It's actually higher than um, uh, diabetes or hypertension, or it's kind of in the same range that you have a 30 percent chance of uh, developing substance use disorder. So these are like really high numbers. And yet, when we think of treating substance use disorder, we don't think about it like treating diabetes or hypertension. Okay, so that, that was addiction. Does anyone have any questions just to pause? Okay. Um, 
Another, another couple of terms that are thrown around, around that I think are really confusing, opiate and opioid. Uh, so just to go through this quickly, opiate is a, a substance that is extracted from an actual plant matter. Uh, so uh, morphine is the original opiate. It was extracted from opium poppies and has been known about for centuries. Uh, also codeine, heroin, opium, although now we can make them synthetically. But opioids is a broader category, and it basically involves any substance with the same chemical structure that will bind onto the mu receptors in the brain. It's a lot of jargon, but think back to the picture of the brain with the receptors and the smiley faces, and all of these chemicals are affecting the same part of the brain and causing the same response. The difference between these substances um, is one of it is the half-life, so how rapidly it works. So, um, for example, let's see, uh, fentanyl has a very short half-life. So it goes into your brain, and then it goes up really high and causes that euphoria, and then it goes down really fast, and then you're not feeling the effects anymore. So you can imagine something with a shorter half-life having a greater euphoric um, sensation, and then a higher uh, potential to be used in a way that is harmful. Um, this is just talking about what we use opiates for in a medical context. So if you've been in the hospital before and ever had a like, really, really bad pain, we'll often use uh, morphine and fentanyl, but we always have to worry about the secondary effects. So when I'm in the hospital and someone's broken their leg and they're screaming out in pain, um, you'll give them some morphine, but you don't want to give them too much so they have a decreased respiratory drive, and that's, that's actually what ends up leading to overdose and death. All right, this is Eli. All right, so the theme of history, we don't know where we're going until we learn where we've been. And this is from 1980 in the New England Journal of Medicine. The study that they did, it wasn't really a study, it was an editorial, and they concluded that opioid maintenance therapy is a safe, salutary, and more humane alternative than surgery or no treatment at all. And patients with intractable non-malignant pain, so non-cancerous pain, and no history of drug abuse, there was no addiction risk. So this is published in the New England Journal that there's no addiction risk for opiates in the 80s. Something to think about. Um, so that's the first study. Uh, the second study or uh, case that's often cited is in 1986, Dr. Russell Portnoy reported with opioid analgesics, again in non-malignant patients, or non-malignant pain, 38 cases with finding, 38 cases total found that two patients who both had a history of drug abuse, or drug use, I'm sorry, uh, developed addiction. So 36 did not. So again, telling us as physicians that there's no risk for addiction. In 1995, the FDA approved oxycotton and oxycodone. <coughs> From 1995 to 2000, Purdue tripled its sales force and bonuses and promotions for oxycodone from $1 million to $40 million. That's the current lawsuit that we're hearing about. And from 98 to 2001, Purdue handed out coupons for narcotics, and basically oxycodone for a startup dose or a free limited time trial. Um, it wasn't that limited, as we've now learned. Um, pain started becoming a vital sign, and the treatment of pain and customer satisfaction scores in the hospital led to some of the issues we're currently being, we're currently having. Um, so that was in 96, in 98, the Federation of State Medical Boards published a policy promoting the use of opiates to treat chronic pain. So here's your free pass for it. And then 2001, JCHO, which is a sort of a standardizing organization for hospitals, issued pain management standards. So this is your standard of care. This is what you need to do to keep patients happy or safe. Instructing hospitals to measure pain, zero to 10, and prioritize their treatment according to those numbers. 
these are the prescribing rates of opiates over 10 years, roughly, uh, in 2006, all the way to 2016. If you look at 2012, that was roughly equivalent to the population of the United States. So every person could have received an opiate prescription and we would have had a couple left over. Um, so we can go to the next one. That th those don't include children, and obviously so. Um, life expectancy changes in the U.S. This was just published in, um, I think, the New York Times and <coughs> NPR did a segment. For the first time in two years since the 1960s, the life expectancy in the U.S. dropped two times in a row. So in 2014, it was 78.9. People got 0.1 years younger in 2015, 78.8, and then in 2016, 78.6. Uh, the graph shows the, the diseases that are most likely related to these deaths, so heart disease, cancer, unintentional injuries, um, and those are by 100,000. So you take the number that's by the bar, you multiply it by 100,000, uh, those are the number of people that died. Um, so in 2016, um, this was very interesting. We, Dr. Koch mentioned this morning, it's on the downtrend. It's on the downtrend for this quarter, but overall it's not looking uh, like there's much of a difference. Uh, so, 2016, 38,000 gun deaths, 64,000 drug overdoses, 40,000 motor vehicle accidents leading to death, 64,000 drug overdoses. U.S. casualties in the Vietnam War and the Iraq War combined, 62,000. I mean, I... I I like these numbers because you guys can, everybody can infer them for, for themselves. You don't have to assign value to them. They're human lives. Um, so this is the wave, we'll use the word wave, of opiate prescriptions across the U.S. from, from 1999 to 2009. Lighter color states have less opiate problems. Um, as you can see, in 2009, it was a fairly, sing fairly singly colored shade. Um, uh, overdose, so this is the um, location and the number of deaths in the state. Uh, I took a smattering of states from the Northeast area. Uh, Massachusetts in, looks like, second place behind New York uh, in 2016. So 2,227 uh, 2, deaths in 2016 in Massachusetts. New York had 3,638. 3, if you do the population statistics, it's roughly the same. Um, New Hampshire, 481. But um, what I want to point out is that these numbers are all increasing. Not a single state had a dip um, from the ones shown in the Northeast. The other graph is uh, showing what the opioid of choice is. Um, as you can see, heroin, as I think Nilly mentioned, is really low on the list, uh, and other synthetic opioids has skyrocketed. It's become almost exponential. Um, I don't actually, so I've been working in Lawrence for about a year now at Lawrence General. I have yet to see a positive heroin test. Um, so meaning, meaning it's all fentanyl. It's all fentanyl, yeah, let's just <laughs> clarify. <laughs> So this, is, this one's really interesting. There's multiple ways to decipher this data. Um, the top is deaths by age. So uh, the group at the top shows a higher death rate in younger population groups. So the group from 25 to 35 happens to be dying more than the group in the 60s. And you ask yourself, why is this happening? Well, it stems directly from the opiate epidemic. They're exposed to the drug at a young age, they go to treatment, they relapse, and then unfortunately they use the same amount they were using, um, and then it's an overdose. If we look at gender studies, it's mostly men. If we look at race, it's uh, white, non-Hispanic, 89%, uh, 89 with the Latino and black population at five and 11% respectively. Um, and then this one shows the data in a little bit of different way. Um, all groups, it's on the upswing in all groups. Um, not a single minority group has a decrease in opiate deaths. 
Um, again, this is in Massachusetts specifically from 2000 to 2017. Um, the bottom graph shows again that it's more often fentanyl than anything else. The top graph has that um, same number that I showed in the beginning, 1977, so it's off by a little bit. Um, this is by county. I guess you can't really see um, the counties are cut off. Essex is one, two, three, four, five from the bottom, so. 1,700. Yeah, 1,764 deaths in Essex County, which is our county. So if we take a look, there is Suffolk County that beats us up, and that's about it. Oh no, uh, Middlesex as well. So. Um, this is just some stats on uh, Massachusetts in general. Uh, the number of opioid prescriptions has gone up. Um, toxicology shows fentanyl, and 83% of people who died from an opioid-related re overdose in 2013 and 14 had a legal opioid prescription at some point two years prior to their death. Lawrence in comparison, we're here to talk about Lawrence. So in 2016, Lawrence experienced 45 deaths from documented opiate overdose. So this on their, on their autopsy or medical record has opiate overdose as a listed cause of death. 26 in 2015, and if you go back to 2012, six. Methuen had 14 in 2016, seven in 2015, one in 2012. Lowell had 68, 60 in 2015, nine in 2012. Haverhill had 37 in 2016, 29 in 2015, and 13 in 2012. So with that, I'm gonna to switch to treatment, and what are the options? So MAT is the term we use for medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, it can help prevent repeat overdoses. So uh, the SAMHSA, which is an organization dedicated to the study of addiction therapy, defines medicated assisted treatment um, as the use of an FDA-approved medication in combination with counseling behavioral therapies uh, to provide a whole patient approach to treatment of the substance use disorder. So there's three drugs in MAT. Uh, methadone is one of them. It works by changing how the brain and the nervous system respond to pain. It lessens the painful symptoms of withdrawal, and it completely blocks the euphoric effects of opiate and opioids. That being said, it has its own set of euphoric properties. How is it pre it's prescribed? Um, under direct supervi supervision of a physician. Um, sometimes, if you're doing really well, they'll allow take-home doses, but it's very rare. Um, and by law, it can only be dispensed by an OTP, an opioid treatment program that's certified by the SAMHSA organization. Um, so there's a couple of cons. Lining up to receive the medication um, feels really um, detrimental to people. Um, a prior uh, substance use um, disorder person defined it as, uh, or said that methadone mimics the effects of opiates and renders the addict compliant. Label, it is labeled as a treatment and obscures the disciplinary objectives of managing undesirables. So that is the view of methadone that's seen by some, um, some people with substance use disorder. Suboxone um, has a ceiling effect. Um, so what that means is it prevents the withdrawal and it, um, it, it just prevents the withdrawal. There is some euphoric effect to it, but not as high as methadone or um, the substance in question. It lowers the potential for misuse and it diminishes the effects of physical dependency. Any, anyone who has a DEA number who does the special training required by SAMHSA can prescribe Suboxone. So the three of us are able to prescribe Suboxone. Um, it increases access, it lowers the risk of misuse, and patients may not have to take it every day, which is a huge thing for somebody who may miss a dose. Cons could be diverted or used inappropriately. That's up for debate. Uh, naltrexone, Vivitrol. This one's been in the media a lot. Um, it works differently than Suboxone and Methadone because it completely blocks the receptor. Um, so there's no craving, but you can also cause withdrawal. Um, so it's not the best feeling. 
Um, it's prescribed in a pill or an injectable. The pill is taken every day. The injectable is every uh, month, uh, and it can be prescribed by any healthcare provider licensed to prescribe medications. Um, there's no abuse or diversion potential with naltrexone. You either take it or you don't. Uh, you need to abstain from seven to 10 days, which is really hard for some people to do. How many of us can go through seven to 10 days of not having a cup of coffee? I mean, that, that's all I really need to compare it to. Um, and that brings me to why Matt works. So I'm gonna approach this graph using the metaphor of coffee. Every day you have a cup of coffee. That keeps you in your normal state. Once you skip a day's worth of coffee, that afternoon is miserable. You have the headache, you have the shakes, you can't think clearly, and you're just feeling bad overall. You're having a bad day. Multiply that by however many numbers you like, and that's what the normal person that withdraws from an opiate feels. Now add nausea, add vomiting, diarrhea, sweatiness, and then an inability to control any of your bodily fluids. Uh, so Suboxone, Methadone, and Vivitrol keep you from dipping into that red box. Um, this one has been covered a lot in some of the other talks, so I'm going to glance over it. Um, what can your community do to help with addiction? Uh, from everywhere from your local emergency department to first responders to your local health department and community-based organiz organizations has a role. Um, for the sake of time and to make sure we get through everything, I'm going to skip this one and go to Dr. Dono. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit less about medications and some more kind of harm reduction strategies. So I'm going to use the letters SSP, and that stands for Syringe Service Programs, a.k.a. Syringe Exchange or Needle Exchange. Um, and so basically this allows people to exchange needles for clean ones or use needles for clean ones, and it's a harm reduction strategy. Um, so true or false, what do you guys think? SSPs enable people to use. By giving people syringes, you're enabling them to use. <laughs> oh, you debate. I'm glad we have some debate. <laughs> so it's false. Um, there's abundant evidence that shows syringe exchange does not increase any um, anybody using in the community. Um, and some argue that it decreases drug use by connecting people to treatment programs. Um, but there's lots of great evidence that if you give out syringes, people are not using more than they were before. Um, so true or false, syringe exchange results in more needles in the community. True. And by, by what I say, that, that's probably poor, poorly worded. More needles disposed of in the community. Yeah, so false. Good. Less debate here, but um, so studies show that um, that they actually have less dirty syringes out in the community. In Baltimore, they reduced their amount by 50% that they found in the community after a syringe exchange program was started. And in Portland, Oregon, they dropped their improperly discarded syringes by about two thirds, which is pretty substantial, right? It's kind of kind of interesting. Um, so true or false? Um, syringe exchange has public support by local organizations and national organizations. I'm glad we have lots of debate. True. So lots of places um, are supported. So I'm not going to read through the list, but the American Medical Association, the World Health Organization, uh, the Red Cross, the U U.S. Conference of Mayors, they all support syringe exchange. Um, so kind of to, to, to sum up everything, um, syringe service programs reduce um, injection risk behaviors and reduce the amount of HIV incidents in communities. Um, they do not increase drug use, so that means they don't increase initiation, duration, or frequency of use. Um, they allow folks to get enrolled into programs. When people start HIV treatment, they've been shown to have higher retention rates after having syringe exchange in the community. They reduce needle stick injuries amongst first responders, probably because there's less syringes out there, and uh, decrease the syringe pop pollution. And something we've talked about um, a little bit today already is that with fentanyl use, people use syringes way more often, right? Um, so typically a user was using two to five times a day, but now they're using 
10, 20, some people are using 40 times a day, which is mind-numbingly crazy to me, um, how someone could possibly maintain an adequate syringe supply that's clean using that often. Um, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services keeps a website that is strictly dedicated to showing the evidence that syringe exchange decreases HIV rates and does not increase use in the communities. And um, you can see here, <laughs> I'm not going to uh, go through every study, but they keep a, a very large amount of good evidence to support these. Um, and then just some, some words from the World Health Organization. They say that the evidence is overwhelming, that there is no convincing evidence of any major unintended negative consequences, and that needle syringe programs are cost effective. Um, also interesting to note, I know historically we have used um, um, uh, uh, hygiene kits, like bleach kits, to um, reduce HIV, but those have not been shown to have good evidence. And they also, they also had a, in their kind of review statement on, on syringe exchange, they also um, recommended that pharmacies and vending machines um, be instituted in communities to allow people to get better access. Um, so we do syringe exchange at our health center, at Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. Um, these are our numbers for the past calendar year. So we've given out 42,000 syringes and had 23,000 returned to us. That doesn't mean that the rest of those syringes were left hanging out in the community, but we at least collected uh, more than half of what we had given out. Um, those are prescriptions that we gave Narcan or Naloxone. Um, so we gave first-time prescriptions 457 out to folks in the community and refilled 278. Um, I don't have numbers whether or not those refills were because people used them, but one might suspect that a large proportion of those are pe because people used their Narcan prescription. And then we've tested uh, 510 folks out in the community doing outreach work in the past year. Uh, any questions about needle exchange before I move on? Of the people you tested, what percent were positive? Do, uh, I don't know. So 51 new cases. So, there were, so there's 30 some odd new cases in Lawrence in the past year, but not all of those were tested with our outreach workers. I can't give you an honest answer. Sorry, I don't know. Good question, though. Any other questions about needle exchange? Yeah. Well, you were saying about uh, having uh, machines and pharmacies so they could be distributed. Uh, how many people say, for example, in the state of Massachusetts, are in agreement with that? So it's a great question. I think this is definitely a hot topic, right? <laughs> because when you put a kiosk for people that don't to get rid of used syringes, it, it's in the community and people can see it. So it's, and I think, I think part of the, part of internally what I feel, this is my own personal opinion, but I think um, we have a bias that this problem is not necessarily our problem, but it's every community's problem. If you ask me, we should have a needle exchange in every community out there, right? Um, and then it wouldn't feel so bad when a community like Lawrence puts one up. But, but I think we need to be able to discard of these things in an appropriate way and give people access to clean using equipment or we're going to have worsening HIV outbreaks in the community and whatnot. Um, we can dart around it and say it's, it's a bad thing and maybe we shouldn't be doing it, but if the problem's here, it's pretty evident, I think, so. Yeah, I just want to comment on a, a follow-up kind of, um, you know, there clearly seems to be the need for more public education around it. Because then you have all these organizations that are, you know, true or false. Yeah. You could say false because if there was a poll tomorrow, you'd probably have 95% of the people saying, what are we doing? We're enabling these drug addicts, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe even just some informational community awareness type thing on TV, you know, that would, that would be probably a lot more helpful, at least to some, because that will make people think anyway. Because right off the bat, people are thinking you're enabling these folks. Yes, without a doubt. I agree wholeheartedly with you. And I think. Um, I'll get into it in a little bit, but we need to be careful about what we're educating on too, right? Because if we make it to be this choice that people are doing bad things, then it creates this whole stigma that we already have. 
And we need to do more educating that, oh, look, these syringe exchanges don't increase people's use in the community, and maybe it would actually reduce HIV rates and, and the such. So that's a great I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I think if I, in my own personal experience, the majority of the folks that I treat for opiate addiction are definitely not undocumented immigrants. The, the vast majority are other than that. So let's, I think we'll move on for the safety of time. Um, so um, the second thing I'd like to talk about, which is also probably even more of a hot button topic, is safe <laughs> injection facilities. Um, they do not exist in the United States yet, um, but they do exist in Canada and Australia and a bunch of European countries. Um, so essentially, a safe injection facility is um, somewhere you can go and use and be observed after to check for signs of overdose and whatnot. Um, the goals of these facilities are to reduce transmission of disease, decrease overdoses, minimize public drug use, and increase um, access to services. Um, in Vancouver, they found that they were able to reduce people's overdose mortality rates by 35% um, and significantly increase people's access to treatment. They um, also found positive behavior changes, so people were using more clean needles, and um, they did not notice an increase in the number of IV drug users in their community or crime in the area surrounding the safe injection facility. And after three years of this pilot program, the police and local businesses of Vancouver wrote to um, letters of to support to the government to keep the program going. And also the medical associations in both Canada and Australia support these from an ethical standpoint. Um, so who are the typical clients of someone who would use something like this? Typically a younger male who's homeless, unemployed, previously incarcerated. Um, they find that 10 to 39% of folks are engaged in prostitution. Um, many people don't know how to access clean drug equipment such as syringes. Uh, many have overdosed in the past and many inject in public spaces. So essentially the most vulnerable of the drug using population um, are, the, are the people that would use an injection facility. Um, and as far as staff goes, so important to know they don't help people use. Um, they're not there to assist in injection. Um, um, sometimes they can test substances before people use. So if you're worried about fentanyl or carfentanil being in your drugs, they can test that to see. Um, they provide safe equipment. They, they educate folks on how to um, use hygienically and get people into services. And so this is um, uh, the Vancouver example. And if you look, uh, the dotted line going down the middle of the screen is when the injection facility was started in the community. And you can see on the first graph, of course, the use of people using the facility goes up once it starts. And then the, the subsequent three graphs show the amount of public injection drug use, the amount of publicly discarded syringes, and then injection litter. And all of them went down after they started the injection facility. Um, this is a hot debate in Massachusetts. Um, these are articles from, I believe, um, one was in March and the other one was last November. Um, they've been contemplating putting through some legislation in, in Massachusetts to start these. Um, you may have heard that Boston Healthcare for the Homeless does something similar. They, so they do a post-injection um, observed site where you don't use on-site, but once you've used, you can go there and be observed. Um, the Massachusetts Medical Society has written a very long document that supports these, and um, they think it's an ethical and correct thing to do to, um, to essentially minimize the amount of people dying from, from this epidemic right now. Um, this slide is from a local ambulance company in Haverhill, and if you look down in the bottom, those are the amount of overdoses they go on uh, calls for every day. So they average about 1.4 per day. This was, I think, last month. And um, each day of the week, you can see pretty much every day they go on an overdose call. And so some people wonder, should we have offer kits for people to test to see if they have fentanyl? I think in our community, it's not worthwhile because everything's fentanyl. Um, but they do, first responders do use them. And then I just wanted to show this other slide. This is from the DEA's website on um, the management of, of responding to opiate overdoses, and um, that is the amount you need of fentanyl to overdose. So it's two to three milligrams, which is about, I think, six to seven grains of salt. 
<laughs> so um, first responders are, are wary of showing up where there's powder because they're very concerned that they could just overdose from inhaling it. And then um, I just wanted to touch base on advertising campaigns and, and kind of we were touching base about this a little bit earlier. But um, I'm sure we all remember the Just Say No or the Dare campaign of the 90s. So the, the, the motivation behind that campaign was to bring police officers and other folks to educate the youth about the risks of using drugs. And um, in 2009, they did a meta-analysis of um, 20 studies that looked at this campaign, and they found that teens that went into D.A.R.E. were just as likely to use drugs as when they received no intervention whatsoever. So trying to educate people about if you do drugs, you're going to die is, is not, the, not, the, not the message we need to send to people. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen the Resist the Risk campaign that we have going on in Massachusetts. Uh, it's not that dissimilar if you ask me. Um, the second slide says your choices matter, and then the bottom slide, they've removed the bottom one fi the picture finally, um, but it's a picture of a baby going through opiate withdrawal from a mom who was using during her pregnancy. Um, and it more feels like shaming someone than it feels like we're educating somebody about how to fix their, fix their problem. So um, stigma is a big problem, and I think we need to start changing the way we're thinking about this to, to be able to move forward. Um, and then I just wanted to go through, just real quick, um, we do have lots of resources here in Lawrence. We're doing lots of great things. Um, we have methadone. We have many clinics that do uh, buprenorphine and, and Vivitrol. We have um, SOAP programs and, and psych access for, for folks um, looking for counseling. Um, and we do syringe exchange. And the hub meeting and the courts and police are, are all being pretty proactive about this. But we need to keep being more proactive. OK, sure. Um, and then just real quick, so um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, we talked about Suboxone and buprenorphine already. Um, it's not hard to do. It requires eight hours of, of um, training online, and any doctor can start doing it but a lot of doctors don't. Um, so our program right now has 372 patients, and we have at least 26 doctors who are prescribing at our clinic. Um, and uh, hopefully we're gonna start reaching out more to the HIV-infected homeless, um, getting them more access. And one thing that we're doing at the health center is um, training all of our residents to be proficient in this when they graduate. So if you think about it, um, we, if we graduate a class of 10 residents every year, that's 40 doctors. We're kind of, we're a little short of that right now with our numbers, <laughs> but essentially 40 doctors that we're training to be active in doing this when they when they graduate. And if you're trained to do it, then you're more likely to be able to do it when you graduate. Whereas most doctors are not doing it um, on top to start now. Did you want to? <laughs> So, uh, I guess we only have five minutes to go over all the barriers in treating uh, the opioid use epidemic. Um, I, mean, I think you just talked about how we don't have enough prescribers. It's kind of crazy that first day out of medical school you can prescribe as much oxycodone as you want to someone who's injured themselves, but in order to treat the addiction that results from that, you have to have this extra training. Um, actually, a group that I'm involved with is meeting with Monica Burrell on Monday, the Commissioner of Public Health, to make it so that medical students can get that training and not need to go through it again once they're doctors. So I think that's one step in the right direction. Uh, another thing is that there are just not enough methadone clinics. Methadone has been shown to uh, be, one of, be the most effective treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, one problem with methadone is that you have to go every single day to get your methadone. It's not something, there's some rare scenarios, but in most cases, if you are on methadone for your treatment, you cannot go home with a bottle of methadone pills. You have to go every single morning. And so uh, you think about a lot of people in our community with transportation barriers. They might not have their own car, and the bus system doesn't go everywhere. And geographically, you look at the location of the methadone clinics. That can be a huge barrier for some people who want to get this kind of treatment. Um, another thing is that 
uh, the availability of opioid use disorder treatment is not even across the board. Uh, and you will find, um, you know, in communities that are more affluent, more white, that the rate of uh, increase in uh, clinics, and methadone clinics, and providers who can prescribe buprenorphine, that rate is going up at a faster rate in wealthier communities, whiter communities. Uh, and there was a big article in the New York Times recently about that. Um, another thing is that politics are a huge thing, and really this should be a completely bipartisan issue, right? Like there isn't much controversy that we need to address this epidemic. Um, I'm sure that most of you in the room uh, heard about President Trump's talk in New Hampshire like a month ago where he mentioned Lawrence as being this like drug hub. Um, and I think that uh, moving forward, like really this should not be a partisan issue. And so um, I think Dr. Dono said in an earlier talk that we should really say to our politicians and the people representing us that this is something that's really important to us, that we really, um, we really want policies that are going to make it so that medical students can become Suboxone prescribers. We want to have policies where um, there are not that many barriers to getting methadone clinics in our in our communities because this is what's going to solve this epidemic. Oh, and the Turn the Tide campaign was another, um, uh, it was a campaign by the last Surgeon General that was basically addressing this on a national level. Um, I think he put things out on magazines, TV, there were a lot of articles about it, um, emphasizing that medical assisted treatment of opioid use disorder really should not be stigmatized. Another thing that I just think we have to mention whenever we're talking about the opioid epidemic is the criminalization of drug use. Uh, I think something like 30% of people who uh, become addicted to these substances will at some point be in the incarceration system. Right now there's a piece of legislation that you have going through the Massachusetts state government so that uh, medically, medical assisted treatment for opioid use disorder can be available in prisons and jails, but right now, um, I, I visited a, a prison in Massachusetts like two years ago, and um, people will go in uh, and they have opioid use disorder and they will not receive treatment for this, and so they go into withdrawal and they're not given any support for that. Can you imagine someone with diabetes going, uh, becoming incarcerated and going in and not receiving insulin? That would be crazy. And like we learned at the beginning of this talk, substance use disorder is a chronic relapsing disease that once you have it, you will always have it. And so really incarcerating people and then not giving them access to that basic treatment is really inhumane. Yeah, just to add one quick thought about that is the most common time folks overdose is mm -hmm. when you get out of jail. And so really getting mm -hmm. people linked from incarceration to treatment when they're leaving is so important. Mm -hmm. It's the most high risk time in Right, and it's a prime opportunity because they're there, they can't go anywhere, and so just throwing resources at people, I think there's no reason not to do that. Um, so breaking the cycle on Rhode Island, they, are, they were the first state to start providing medically assisted therapy in the incarceration system. Uh, Dr. Coe already talked about this this morning, but this is like a really important subject for me. I think the language that we use around addiction is key. And Stigma, all right, we don't have any time to talk stigma. I'm just kidding. But, uh, but stigma, I mean, I think that's a pervasive theme throughout this subject. Um, all right, I think we covered a lot. We're not gonna have time to go through all this. Oh, pick up Narcan. Um, at every pharmacy uh, in Lawrence and in Boston, there's just a standing prescription, so you don't need a prescription from your doctor. You can just go and um, pick up some Narcan, and you never know when you might be walking down the street and see someone who's overdosed and save their life. And it's very easy to do. You don't really need any special training. You just stick it up someone's nose, and, and I think that really we should all be carrying this around with us. Do you guys know when the, where the most common place to overdose is? Public restrooms, yeah. So any of us yeah, can, can encounter Yeah, restaurants. Beside my uh, uh, living, uh, where I live, there's been five death overdoses yeah. just this week. Yeah. All right, so we'll open up to questions. Yeah, great. So thank you very much, Dr. Lee, Dr. Adam, Dr. Doe. Appreciate it. We have about 12, 13 minutes that we can have. I know there's lots of questions. Very hot topic. 
you just raise your hand, just go one at a time. Yes, ma'am. I, my name is Bob Lindberg. I, I have a question. We have, uh, say, facilities for, you know, treatments and whatnot. Somewhat, I, I believe, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, 60 days. Uh, I believe, personally, uh, that's a little, say, too short for some people who've been, say, using for a long time. The other part of the question was, if it was, uh, say, 180 days, and it was, say, mandatory, then they have less chance of me using it again and then have to go through the step one again and you get, you know, continue at home. I think that's a great point. And so I find the vast majority of folks who get into detox will get treated for five to seven days yeah. and then they're back to the community, you know? Yeah, exactly. and, and we, we don't do a good job in the medical field of communicating between detox and methadone and suboxone or buprenorphine in the clinic. I just had a patient last week who wanted to get clean. He was in my program getting suboxone. It wasn't working. And so I, we talked about it and he said he was going to get into a detox and then switch to methadone. He got into detox and then was discharged from detox and went to the methadone clinic and was told, no, sorry, you're, you're not quote unquote dirty. You need to come back after using something. So he was sent home, had to go use, and God forbid he overdosed, oh my gosh, imagine, and then had to enter uh, so the methadone what clinic. what was the purpose of that? that I, you asked, you tell me, I don't know. We need to communicate better, is the, is the, the message at the end of the day, is there, yeah, needs to be, there needs to be better communication across the board, and there's not. Just you know, one of the victims of this are the children of these sure. people. And, uh, and, and, and it's very difficult. We have a generation of children who have suffered through this, and the implications are, are really profound. And we talk about no stigma, but if you're taking your kids away, how can they not feel a stigma <laughs> yeah. when, when they leave a courtroom? Yeah. And those of us who take the kids away feel we have no choice. Mm -hmm. We have no choice. Is the um, children safe? Um, yeah, because we're thinking of the safety of the children and the implications of being around fentanyl. Oh, you know, so we're caught in a, in, a, in a real difficult situation. You bring up a really good point on the labor and delivery service. DCF is called if you have a positive urine. And the only thing keeping that mother from using is the child that she tells you it's the child in front of you. And then you go, you have to take her away or him away. And then mom goes home and uses. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's an awful cycle. Yeah, it is. But I think um, historically this has been seen as something that you can't recover from. I think all the stories in the media are about people who uh, just continue to use and overdose and die. But now that we have more treatment options for people with substance use disorder, I'm hoping that in like the next decade that we'll have more generation of people who have a history of addiction but are living into their 60s and 70s. Um, right now it's very unusual to meet anyone above the age of like 40 with addiction because they've died. And I think that um, moving forward, I mean, I've, we work in labor and delivery in the hospital and pediatrics, and I've taken care of babies who are have just been born and are withdrawing from neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, but often uh, I've worked with moms who were on methadone during their pregnancy, and they are stable, and they've been stable for many years, and they are able to take care of their children. And I think there's a lot of stigma against people who use methadone, but hopefully we're working. I think we recognize that, and mm -hmm. we're trying to maintain those kids with those mothers, right. trying to maintain them in programs where mm -hmm. kids can be with the mothers. Mm -hmm. But the relapse is still occur, and, and mm -hmm. it's so sad. Yeah. Let me get the question up here. Uh, yeah. yeah, how do you determine if someone needs to pin up and, uh, naltrexone or methadone and for like pregnant women who have opioid use disorder I've had that it's better to use one over the other so could you go it's, it's a that's a, a bit of a complicated question I think you tailor tailor it to the patient okay. there are some people 
who methadone is probably the important thing because they have a daily interaction with somebody. They have to go to groups every week. They're, and some people, their lives are too chaotic to go home with a one-week prescription of Suboxone and, and, and do well. So typically a, a good candidate for Suboxone is someone who has a little more support, who maybe works, who has like family and support services and people that they can go to with that week prescription or two week prescription. They can go up to a, a month or two months with prescriptions with that. So typically you need to be a little more stable. And then, and then Vivitrol, the injection, um, is most beneficial for folks who can get clean for those five to seven days or seven to 10 days rather. And a lot of people can't do that. And so the evidence to support Vivitrol for opi opioid addiction is not good. Um, and then for pregnant women, the evidence is actually kind of coming a little bit closer between methadone and, and buprenorphine. Um, methadone, you typically, the babies will withdraw a little bit longer, but, um, but typically that one's, methadone has been shown to be the most effective in, in moms, but it's, I think buprenorphine's kind of on, on its way up. So I think it depends on the mom and what she is gonna be successful with. Is this your body? No? Okay. Yes. Um, somebody has an asked a question. Yeah, she's standing, she's standing up there. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, go right ahead. Um, I'm not sure if I'm quite getting the question. Is, so, is the long term medication of psychiatric problems like an addiction? Um, so I would consider addiction a long term psychiatric problem. And they go hand in hand. They're, you're, it's like an apple and an orange, you know. And they need long term, without a doubt, need long term treatment. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is it fair to say that that um, if you are treated like with an opioid and you have a propensity to become addicted, if there's something that pushes you in that direction, that then you need to, then you have, it's like you've reached a tipping point and then after that you have this chronic <coughs> disease sort of look at it. I think that's probably fair to fair say. Fair way to look at that? I think, yeah, I think so. You guys can step in if you think I'm different. So like, I think we're all genetically predisposed to become addicted or not, right? Yeah. And then once you get into that habit, once you become dependent on it and your body is all of a sudden made all these receptors that need to be stimulated all the time and you try and take that away, good luck to you. It's going to be really hard, you know? And we're creatures of habit in general outside of the physical stuff. Like, the way we work is habit. And so if you break somebody's habit, our brains don't know how to function. So. I think a lot of people are more familiar with alcohol because opioid, opioids are a re relatively new thing, but you know, alcoholism has been like an issue for centuries. And uh, I don't know, a lot of, most people know someone who has alcoholism and um, you know, you'll talk to someone who's been sober for 20, 30 years and they'll still talk about having a craving to drink or like being in a bar and seeing someone and just wanting to pick up that glass of beer, but it just takes one drink to go back into their cycle of, um, being addicted really to that substance, and I would say that with these drugs, it's really pretty much the same. I have a lot of patients who come for buprenorphine treatment, and they think, oh, I just need the med for a month or two and I'll be good. And that's never real. Sometimes that's the answer, but usually it's not. Usually people need to be in treatment for years before they're ready to think about coming off of the medication. Some people can, and some people need to be on it for the rest of their lives, you know. I do want to comment. Oh, go ahead. Uh, just going to ask a question. My, my understanding is that the United States uses 80% of the world's pharma opiates, and we have not even 4 <laughs> 92, of as of last month, 92. And, and so how does the rest of the world manage their pain, and, and how do we convince <laughs> They have doctors that aren't so nice, probably. <laughs> Actually, um, you know, Eli mentioned all those ads about how this was the miracle drug to treat pain, 
but actually now there have been studies about chronic pain management and opioids are not effective in treating pain. So I think that's a misconception. They're very effective in, in treating acute pain if you, if you have, um, you know, if you broke a bone, I think that's the most common example that yes, they will treat your pain for like a week or two weeks, but like I was explaining with the tolerance, that someone who has chronic back pain or a chronic, after an injury, a chronic, any type of pain, once you've been on one of these opioids for more than a few weeks or months, they're not effective in treating pain. And so in other countries, they, I mean, they just don't have access to pharmaceuticals, that's often the reason, but really we should not be using opioids anymore to treat pain. And I think for all of us, I mean, we're being trained as new doctors, right? And in medical school now, they say you should not be using opioids to treat pain, and that's brand new as of the past like five years. Um, oh, the other thing is, so big pharma has a huge role. Um, a lot of those foreign countries that have people that have a lot of pain don't have a lobbying position for pharma. So when you have pharmaceutical companies telling you this is what you need to prescribe, and then you have societies that are involved in the medical fields condoning this, you don't really have an out because your patient sitting there listening to the commercial for oxycodone for their back pain and then look at all of these places that say this is okay, why won't you give me the prescription? At some point, the doctor is going to become tired of having that argument. So I have one more question and I'm going to ask it. So <laughs> and they'll be around for a few minutes after your right. so you get a follow-up question. So the question is this, at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, uh, if I were to go, anybody were to go there, is there a charge to get the Narcan? Or if you know that person is suspected as being someone who uh, has an addiction, do you typically just give them out or give it out? Good question. If you go to our pharmacy, um, you will, um, if you have insurance, it's covered. If you don't have insurance, you can ask our pharmacist for um, some help paying for it. And if that's worst comes to worst, our outreach workers are often giving it to people with other funds um, outside of that. So you can get it. And I follow up question, which I'm not going to ask. I heard that those prices are going to go up in the very near future because of the trust that the agreement that the, the AG's office had is now being extinguished. So we're talking like about that. Month, yeah. yeah. That's a so thank thing. you so much. All through, it is 3:30, and you're going to start off all over. But thank you so much for coming.